Hello everybody. Welcome to Lecture 1 Part 2. And we're kind of setting the stage, you know, we're kind of taking a big philosophical picture for the most part uh, at the beginning of the course here. Uh, I believe we have a discussion board. Your first discussion board is an assignment embedded in this one. So, topic right now, legality, morality, and justice. So, uh, also you can see all the backgrounds in this particular lecture are going to be photographs that I took of lava on the big island uh, that is Hawaii, right? And, and at the time, this is many years ago, but this was kind of some of the newest land on the planet, which I think is, is pretty cool, the result of pretty darn fresh lava flows. And the flow continues to this day. So, it's a great way to write off a vacation, right? If I use the pictures in a lecture, then I can call it a business trip. Not so much. I don't think I could do that. I, I don't. Th I don't think that's right, and I don't like to cheat like that. And good discussion for legality, morality, and justice. Uh, just because it's legal doesn't necessarily mean it's right in a moral sense. And that's something that we're going to tease out as we move through this. Now, two types of law to consider: uh, malum in se and, and malum in prohibitum. Uh, so, an offense that's malum in se is, is, is one that's naturally evil. And this is like murder, theft, the offenses of the like. Uh, offenses of the common law uh, have a special term, malum in se se. But the idea of malum in se is this is an offense that seems inherently evil, wrong, right? Uh, now, contrast that to an offense that's malum in prohibitum. On the contrary, it's not naturally an evil, but becomes wrong or illegal because there's a law that prohibits it. Uh, so, uh, playing at games, right? And this this is old language, right? That that I, I took from uh, a legal text. Playing at games, right? Gambling uh, is gambling illegal? Well, it is illegal in some states. Is it immoral? Well, that's that's a, a matter of judgment, right? So, if there's a law against gambling, something that isn't evil in itself, then we would would call it malum and prohibitum. But murder, taking one's life, is inherently wrong, w without cause, right? It is going to be malum and se. And you say, well, how can I tell the difference between malum and prohibitum and malum and se? Well, here's the deal. Right, right off the bat, I'm going to say, is there an immediately discernible victim? So if someone is murdered, yes, there's a victim, right, and their life was taken from them. Uh, if there's a theft, theft, shoplifting, whatever, there is an immediately apparent victim. Now, malum and prohibitum, when we look at a law like prohibition of alcohol in the United States, who was the victim? Well, that is, if I take a drink, I don't believe there's an immediately discernible victim. The, the rationale for prohibition was, I leave the factory, right, I'm the, I'm the male of the family, I'm the breadwinner, you know, we're back in the 1910, 1920, uh, and on my way home, because I get paid every day and I get paid in cash, I stop at the bar, right, and I get myself shit-faced and I spend all my money in the bar and then I come home to my family and I have no money for my wife or children, right, and no food. So women were getting tired of this crap and they developed temperance leagues and, and they protested against liquor and eventually had liquor right, made illegal, and that was the process of prohibition. Notice, though, that the victim is far removed, and it's a chain of consequences that eventually leads us to a possible victim. So when I'm asked, is this malum and prohibitum, or malum and say, for me, the easiest way to go, do I have an immediately discernible victim? And, and if I shoplift, then the store is the immediately discernible victim, right? If I commit a murder, we have an immediately discernible victim. But uh, if someone smokes pot, the victim is far removed, right? And we have to kind of tell this long-winded tale to get to how this crime, right, caused a, a victim. And notice when it's malum and prohibitum, these things shift with the time. So gambling was illegal in the state of Ohio, but then we passed laws that now allow gambling under certain circumstances in certain places, so it's no longer illegal. Uh, but So morality and legality are not the same thing. So what we, what we can say then, let's, let's take an example of this case, the case of Lester Zagaimak. He killed his brother George. George was involved in a serious accident. The accident didn't kill him, but it, it left... 
uh, uh, George, in excruciating pain, and the doctors, after you know many tests, said there is absolutely no chance of recovery. So basically, George is left to lay in his hospital bed in excruciating pain for the rest of his existence. Well, George didn't want to live out his <laughs> the rest of his days and such. So when his Le his brother Lester comes to visit, he says, "Lester, here's the deal, man. Uh, I, I can't take this anymore. I I'm not going to be able to survive like this. Uh, you know, I I'm awake all the time. I'm a I'm in constant and unremitting pain. It's never going to get any better." And he looks his brother right in the eye and he says, "Dude." I can't do it for myself, so I'm relying upon you. I, I want you to kill me. I, I want you to assist my suicide, essentially, or, or carry out my suicide on my behalf. Now, this becomes problematic, as you can imagine. So, what did Lester do? Well, he wanted to honor his brother's wishes. His brother asked him to honor his wishes. Right, Quincy? So what does Lester do? He says, well, okay, so i got to figure out how to kill him. So I'm going to kill him. I, I guess I will use a shock. Uh, I'm going to shoot him. Uh, and I should probably use a shotgun because a shotgun's about as most lethal as anything can be at close range. And then he said, but the shotgun has all those pellets that spread out, and, and maybe that's not a good thing. So Lester actually went to the trouble to take apart the shotgun shell, right, and then pour wax so the wax would solidify around the pellets and hold them together in, in one... Uh, one unit, right? And, and you, you guys that hunt deer, right, in the state of Ohio, if you hunt deer with a shotgun, you know, you can use a slug, right? The, there's already a tool available. Uh, it wasn't necessary that Lester devise, you know, or, or manipulate the ammunition, but he did, you know, because he didn't know any better. He's, he's not a wizard in ballistics, let's say. So he has a shotgun, and now he has a shell which he believes is more lethal to fire from the shotgun. But he says, I can't just walk into the hospital, right, Quincy, carrying the shotgun. Shotgun, that might attract some attention. Might, right? This is before open carry states and all that nonsense. So what he does then is he saws the barrel off the shotgun. So the barrel, you know, protrudes this much from the handguard. Well, he saws that portion off. And the thing is, now he can slip it under his coat and, and no one will see it. And then he goes in. He says goodbye to his brother. He shoots him with the shotgun. Boom. Uh, and, and, of course, Lester dies. Uh, I mean, George dies at that point in time. And what does Lester do? Well, he sets the shotgun down. He sits down in the chair and he waits for the events, the consequences to unfold. And sure enough, you know, hospital personnel come in, uh, the police arrive, and he's arrested. Now, what does a district attorney decide to do? Well, the district attorney decides to charge Lester with premeditated first-degree murder. And, and what does it mean, premeditated first-degree murder? Well, there's usually some bars that have to be crossed for it to be premeditated and be first-degree. Did, was there planning involved? And that's one of the criteria. And, and certainly there was. It was a premeditated crime. Lester thought long and hard on how to accomplish this crime, right? He weighed the pros and cons of his action, and, and that also influenced his choice of weapon and his technique. And then the willfulness, he intended to carry out the plan, and we'll talk a lot about intent, right? So the intention of, the, of carrying out the plan was present. So the district attorneys in court, it looks like a slam dunk, you know, we're going to put Lester away for life, probably, uh, uh, for premeditated murder. What was the verdict, do you think? And this is always where it gets tricky, because remember, we got a trial by jury, so we got 12 people who are going to come to some kind of consensus and make a determination. So, in fact, the verdict was not guilty. And you go, well, why the heck? He committed the murder, right? Uh, there's no, he planned it. It, it, it. It's clear that he was guilty. Uh, there's no one else who could have done it. There's no ally. It was guilty, right? So why did the jury say not guilty? Well, the jury comes back and says, look, the morality of caring for his brother was more important than the legality of the act. And I think it's a good example to demonstrate morality versus legality. And also, now this represents a conflict or, you know, kind of a sub-dilemma to our four dilemmas. Now, mercy killing, as this was, he did it out of mercy for his brother, uh, doesn't necessarily always end up the same way. And we can talk about uh, Dr. Jack Kevorkian, also known as Dr. Death back in the day. And Kevorkian was not so lucky. 
Dr. Kevorkian built devices. He, he made devices, individual devices, so that people could take their own lives, depending on the level of their disability. So these are terminally ill patients who are have nothing ahead of them but suffering, endless suffering, and Kevorkian helps them. He doesn't kill them, but he builds the device that they can commit suicide. And these might be people that are completely paralyzed. Perhaps they have nothing but the ability to move their tongue. So he develops a machine, right, that will uh, dispense an agent that will kill them that could be manipulated with their tongue. So these are, these are custom-built devices to allow these people to, in fact, end their own lives. Well, he was in and out of court, as you can imagine, more than once, and eventually uh, he was convicted of second-degree murder in 1999 in Michigan. He was recently released. He subsequently died. Uh, the idea was, though, that he participated in or he facilitated the suicide of these folks, and, and that constituted second-degree murder. So what do we know? Well, check it out. Megality versus, I mean, uh, malum and prohibitum or malum and say. And these are tough ones, right? Uh, and, and what happened back in 94, oh, uh, Oregon was the first state in the United States to make provisions for physician assisted suicide. And that is that if a physician says that the patient is, is terminally ill, that there's no recovery possible, and another physician will sign off on it, and there's a bunch of paperwork and analysis, et cetera, that at some point then that person can uh, give the signal and they can be put to death to release them from their endless suffering. Washington State went on to adopt this law, as have California. So we can see that, that, that suicide, which is illegal in most states under these conditions, uh, it was malum and prohibitum, right? Because there's a long history. There's cultures that, that put suicide as, a, as an inherent right to the individual, right? And, and many cultures, uh, not the United States, but at this point in time, then they make allowances for suicide. Interestingly, my mom, as she was descending into dementia, and, and it's so sad, you know, because often uh, as people descend into dementia, they're aware of their loss of faculties. And at one point she said she didn't really know what the purpose was, and she asked us to ask her doctor to inquire about physician-assisted suicide because it became legal in California where she was at the time. Uh, the doctor, of course, had already diagnosed her with Alzheimer's disease, so she was not competent to make the decision or allowed to make the decision to participate in suicide. Uh, it's kind of fascinating case. So, Ultimately, we moved her from California as she needed increasing levels of care to Ohio here so we could hang out with her and see her every day and, and get her in a memory care unit and facilitate it. But... Uh, these are issues that are not easy, easily answerable, and we can expect differences of opinion when, when people view these. Uh, the, the deal is, and, and critical thinking really necessitates that we are able to look at both sides of the issue uh, at, at a minimum, right? Uh, it's a, like I said earlier, have your opinion, that's fine, but can you state the other person's opinion as equally cogently as your own, I, I think is often important. What are the pros and cons, right? And there's going to be pros to everything, and there's going to be cons to everything. So being able to negotiate those and, and kind of weigh them. It also is a precursor to then uh, developing testable hypotheses to provide evidence that supports the relationship of the pros to the cons. So, the obligation to help. Let's talk about the moral imperative or, or, or legal obligation. Should you be required to help others when they're in need, or is that a choice, your individual right to choose to help or not? And you know where I'm going with this probably. Uh, we created duty to assist laws that create penalty for failing to help, right? And why did we do that? And, and this is a, a point in the course where we maybe need to introduce a new idea. That people often think that the solution to all our problems is we need a law. So the press then amplifies an occurrence brings it up on everyone's radar, and then we have this continuous exposure to this occurrence, this situation, and at some point we may find that this, what has happened is so heinous that people 
rise up and say there ought to be a law and that's the term ah, there ought to be a law there ought to be a law right and then uh, you know if there's enough impact and, and there's enough power behind this then legislators are often forced compelled to develop a law well let's talk about the the tragic story of Kitty Genovese right and Kitty Genovese was murdered and she was murdered in the courtyard of her apartment building this was a case in the 1960s and immediately although it happened in New York attracted national attention it was in all the newspapers and on all the television news right and I've uh, kind of found a graphic uh, on this uh, a graphic art kind of cartoon book right strange subject but I'm gonna read you just this one frame here from it raped tortured killed here in New York outside her own apartment building almost 40 neighbors heard screams nobody did anything nobody called cops some of them even watched do you understand what happened in this context and what did happen well there's Kitty Genovese's gravestone at the ripe old age of what uh, that's 1935 to 64 so she's 29 years old 30 years old what happened well we're gonna take this from Gantz a reporter for the New York Times uh, who is interviewing law enforcement who was you know dealing with the case here is what happened for more than half an hour 38 respectable law-abiding citizens in Queen watched a killer stalk and stab a woman in three separate attacks in Kew Gardens twice their chatter and the sudden glows of their bedroom lights interrupted him and frightened him off each time he returned sought her out and stabbed her again not one person telephoned the police during the the, the assault one witness called after the woman was dead so, as we've reconstructed the crime, he said, the assailant had three chances to kill the woman during a 35-minute period. He returned twice to complete the job. If we'd been called when he first attacked, the woman might not be dead now. This is what police said happened at 3.20 a.m. in the staid middle-class tree-lined Austin Street area in the Kew Gardens apartment building. And, and this was, of course, attracted national attention. And, and it creates this introspection and this soul searching for the entire country. Because the question that follows is who are we and what have we become that we can watch a woman get murdered and not even do the minimum? of picking up a telephone and calling the police. What's to stop us as we're watching this crime and then from the safety of four floors up or wherever the hell I am, opening my window and screaming out there, get away from her, I'm calling the police. No one did anything. So laws were written that says, hey, if you see something going down, you've got to intervene. Wow. There ought to be a law and a law was drafted to address this lack of effort, this lack of concern by uh, Kitty Genovese's neighbors. Okay. Now, does it matter? Does it change things? Well, here's a little uh, piece that occurred. What, this is 2009, so this is uh, like 40 years later, if you will, 45 years later. Police cars sit parked outside Richmond High School on Tuesday in Richmond, California. Authorities, right? What do we find? The gang rape and beating of a 15-year-old girl on school grounds after her homecoming dance was horrific enough. But even more shocking, police say, was that up to 20 people watched and did nothing to stop it. So this does seem to be kind of a universal human problem. In fact, some people even took pictures with their cell phones of the poor girl as she was being repeatedly raped. Eh? So why don't people intervene and why do people even go so far as just to sit and observe in some kind of strange manner? So the obligation to help, is it a moral imperative or should it be a legal obligation? And again, morality versus the law. So duty to assist laws, when, the, when people are screaming there ought to be a law, duty to assist laws create penalties for failing to help. So if you fail to help in those situations, under that law in those jurisdictions, then you can be held liable. You can be criminally prosecuted for your failure to help. But here's the issue. So I see someone collapse, and I say, oh my God, that person's collapsed, and I check for their pulse, right? And, and they, they don't have a pulse. I, I put the back of my hand up to their nose. I don't feel any breath, 
right? And, and I, I check, you know, I check the, for the pulse in the neck. There's nothing. So I say, oh, my God, I must do CPR. And then I try and rack my brain from my Red Cross training, which is, you know, X number of years ago. And I say, I have to do CPR. And I start pumping on the person's chest. And I crack a rib, puncture their lung. But they survive. They come back to life, right? Well, this has happened. This has actually happened. And then the victim, the, the, the person who was resuscitated by the civilian, the passerby, sued the passerby <laughs> for cracking their rib and puncturing their lung. I know, I know, right? So the Good Samaritan laws, <laughs> and we say, you can't, you can't sue people for helping you. I mean, that's absurd, right? And having sub -subsequ subsequent injury. No, there ought to be a law. So now we got a law. We said there ought to be a law. And then the consequences of that law cause behaviors that cause another problem that people want to address with yet another law. Good Samaritan laws were then instituted to protect those who render assistance from civil prosecution. When your, the help you render is within the realm of your capacity, your abilities, right, within your training, then you do have a duty to assist, but it's limited. So for most of us, the duty to assist laws really say that we need to do nothing more than alert the authorities. We need to call 911 or whatever it is. And, and beyond that, then it gets to be too much. Now, if you're a doctor or a nurse, right, then you're held to a different standard than if you're an untrained civilian. But for the most part, so, but, but I think it's fascinating because we have layer of law upon law upon law. And, and that's how the law, you know, evolves over time. Now, let's talk a little bit about intention because remember, in the case of Lester Zagaymak, Lester was said to have intended the killing of his brother George. And it's clear that he did. Let us play a little bit with the fourth dilemma. You remember that one? Psychology versus the legal system? Well, let's look, because this is a great place to kind of uh, check out how this works. right? Intention in the law versus psychology. In the law, Intention is seen as committing an act deliberately, willfully, and knowingly as distinguished from committing an act by mistake, accident, negligence, or carelessness. And this makes a huge difference, right? This can be the difference between a murder charge and a manslaughter charge which has huge consequential differences. So the law is very clear on this. The law is looking for what they call a guilty mind or mens re. Now, some people have, though, kind of flipped this around and attempted to use it as a defense. For example, let's suppose, right, that I, uh, uh, one case, a man takes a handgun and he decides he wants to murder his wife. He's going to kill his wife. So he takes the handgun, right, and he looks at the magazine. The magazine is loaded. He stuffs it into the handgun, and then he cocks the hammer, points it at her, click, 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 the gun doesn't fire. Can he be tried for attempted murder? And he, 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 he tries this weird defense. He says, well, you know, uh, the gun wasn't loaded, so it couldn't be attempted murder. And, and the courts come back, and courts are pretty smart like this. They say, look, you're a dumbass. I'm sorry that you didn't think once you put the magazine in to pull the slide back and put the round actually in the chamber. But your stupidity is not a defense. You intended to kill, so that's attempted murder and a story, right? Uh, being a dummy doesn't release you from your... So that would be known as an impossible act, right? He's trying to use the defense of an impossible act. It would be impossible to kill her or attempt to kill her if the gun is unloaded. That doesn't fly, right? What was present in this case is he had an intent that's mens re, a guilty mind is the literal translation there. Mens re was established, a guilty mind, and he is then liable for uh, the intent to uh, commit murder. So, that's the legal system's picture of intent, right? What do you think, Quincy? That's what I think. Now, let's see how psychologists can really muddy up the water, okay? Intent in psychology is more a matter of motivation. <laughs> And motivation comes in many different flavors and many different levels. 
And in fact, okay, wait a second, I'm going to give you a commercial here, shameless self-promotion. If you're interested in the psychology of motivation, did you realize that the Ohio State Psychology Department offices, offers a course in psychology of motivation? Just in case you're ever interested. It's taught every spring. Who's it taught by? Hmm, so I can find that course. Yeah, it's taught by me. So mo motivation was my, one of my research areas. Uh, I love teaching the class. So anyway, end of commercial, end of shameless self-promotion. Right? So intent in psychology is a matter of motivation. And, and what it does then, it arrays on a continuum from absence of intent or absence of motivation to absolute motivation. Now, pure accidents, there's no intention, right? So, and, and there's no motivation in a pure accident, so that's at the bottom end. That's, that's the zero point. Now, reflex actions, and you say, well, reflex, that is someone strikes out at me, and I hit them, right? In, in response, they take a swing at me, and I go to deflect the swing, I hit them, and then they happen to fall and crack their skull open and die. I might say, well, you know, uh, I didn't intend that, but from a biological organism point of view, and, and psychologists can go there, maybe a neuroscience says, well, that was a reflex, but a reflex is intending. That is, if I close my eye, as an object is coming at my eye and I close it, that's a non-conscious intentional act. I didn't consciously will it, the non-conscious, but notice that there is still an intent, but it was a non-conscious rather than a conscious intent. I know, that's getting pretty slippery. But notice that reflexes, uh, well, I mean, you know, this is one step below habitual responses. Now, actions motivated by unconscious factors, these are thought to be largely under or out of our control, right? So in a legal system, this would not fly, but you know, these are actions that are motivated by unconscious factors, and this could be the, the acquisition of habit over time. Now, actions taken under stress, that is when I'm in a stress state, my inhibitory processes might be eroded to a certain degree, right? And I might do things under stress that I wouldn't normally do. But it does signify a level of intent. Now, whether we want to make a person responsible for that or not becomes an issue to sort out in the court and a jury to ultimately decide. And I, I don't know what to say about this one. Actions following hypnotic suggestion. Uh, psychologists, psychologists in the room, you know that we don't, we don't even know that hypnosis is legitimate, right? I mean, many people will debate this uh, ad infinitum. Now, actions growing out of social transactions, though, that is, if I'm in a bar and I get into an argument with someone, this has now become a social transaction, right? I'm in a bar, I'm in a fight, I'm in an argument with someone, and it escalates to a physical brawl. Uh, that indicates a higher level of intent. Now, actions in which the consequence is foreseeable, and this is a, an area that we also studied in our research, that we tend to hold people more responsible for an outcome if that outcome was foreseeable. If we say, wow, you know, if, if you scream at some people uh, a racial epithet in, in a bar and that starts a fight, right, that's foreseeable. You say, well, you know, I was just talking, but no, I mean, if you talk smack to someone, it's foreseeable that they might respond. So intent is really climbing up on the list now. Now, actions directed by conscious intent for psychologists, this, this is where we get to uh, the, the gold standard, right? And we match up with the legal system. So the legal system is really looking at the last psychological point, using that as its gold standard. Psychologists are much more flexible in the application of intent. But... Uh, thankfully, probably not so much, because this would really, I think, be confusing and misleading to jurors. Uh, so, I hope it wasn't confusing or misleading to you. And, and let's let's do a homework assignment about this. So, let's use these four motivations. I pulled four off the psychologist list. Actions directed by conscious intent as the most severe, right? Going down to actions motivated by unconscious factors. I tried to make the most, take the most reasonable ones out of the list. And what are we going to do for homework two? Well, each team member gets a different motivation from the above list, right? So the four of you, each one 
takes one of those off the list, right? Write a story about two men with the ultimate consequences the death of one man at the hands of the other. So this is imagination time, and I'm going to ask you to use your imagination uh, quite often in this course. Uh, I'm borrowing kind of this idea from my advisor, Dr. Tetlock. Uh, he often had us in the lab sit down when we're in lab meetings and especially when we're doing preliminary thinking about a study he said we're going to conduct some thought experiments so we would then run through the thought experiments to kind of get a picture a big picture of what we were intending to research right so include in the story what happened how it came to happen what was the alleged perpetrator's state of mind that supports the level of motivation assigned? So what I'm really doing is looking for you to apply, right, to work through the thinking to really get a solid understanding of these different levels of intent. How would they play out in the real world, right? Then each team member chooses a teammate's story. No duplicates, please. So this is, again, uh, you know one-on-one -on -one kind of situation and write a brief counter argument that the mens rea did in fact exist which is something that a prosecuting attorney would do so a defense attorney might try to argue back the level of intent so it falls below mens rea or guilty mind or conscious intent but the prosecutor is going to do their damnedest to try to create a perception in the jury that a conscious intent did exist so let's work through that and, and uh, on these assignments note that many of these assignments don't necessarily have a clear right or wrong answer so when your work is being assessed what we're going to be looking for is the level of thought that you put into this did you really think it through right and that's easy to tell when we read something does someone think this through or did they just pull this pull this out of their ass at the last minute you know two minutes before the assignment was due and note also that you're coordinating with a teammate so you got to get this done a couple days beforehand so that your teammates have an uh, a time to consider it and, and, and complete the assignment right so you're really dependent upon each other and you really got to sort this out you got to figure this out you got to manage this uh, this part of it uh, and, and maybe you're not used to that but welcome to uh, you know I come out of the business world and, and these are the kinds of things that are expected there's deadlines there's more immediate there's proceeding deadlines uh, so develop a plan and work through it right so it should be relatively simple for motivations one through three I think number four is going to be more challenging but remember again there's not a right or wrong what we're really looking for is the quality of thought in an assignment such as this and hopefully it facilitates your understanding of intent and how it plays out in the real world so I need a brief cup of coffee here I mean a drink of coffee and let's continue so uh, to me one of the most fascinating areas of social psychology uh, centers around this primary human motivation and uh, when I was 15 years old in high school I decided I wanted to become a social psychologist uh, and, and why did I want to become a social psychologist uh, because the social psychologist looks to the power of the situation to shape people's behavior and as I was growing up as a teenager I would see some of my friends do things that I would never dream that they would do based on their personality their values their characteristics but they would do this thing and I go why on earth did they do that and that's the primary human human motivation is to ask the question why did they do that that is to assign a cause to behavior right so primary human motivation is to understand the causes of an actor's behavior right Penelope you don't get down all right I'm probably angry because Clinton's in her I mean Quincy's in her spot so why do we need to do this why do we want to understand the cause of someone's behavior as Fritz Heider put it right that it allows us to predict what people will do in the future if we understand what caused them to behave they the way they did in the past right and if we can predict people's behavior 
then, dare I say it, from a manipulative point of view, I may be better able to control a person's behavior. That is, if I can control a stimulus that someone's exposed to, knowing how they will respond to that stimulus, I go from predict to control. And this is something that we do, especially in relationships. This is one of the areas that I wanted to research before I came to Ohio State, was how people operate these mechanisms in uh, dyadic relationships. And, and partner relationships. But that would have been studying at, at SUNY Buffalo and uh, I ended up at Ohio State doing something uh, slightly different. But this is a study of attribution theory. So those of you who've had your social psychology class back in the day, there used to be chapter, usually chapter four was on attribution theory. Uh, people have a hard time understanding the word attribution, so they change the, the title of that chapter typically to person perception. So attribution theory roughly divides the world into two types of causes or two categories of causal explanations for observed behavior. Those derive from the actor's disposition. And these are the easy ones. These are the automatic. These come up first. Gloomy Gus came to my party and is a big downer. And why was Gloomy Gus a big downer at my party? Duh, because he's gloomy. Right? So a trait-based, dispositional-based, character-based explanation is super simple. Right? My tightwad friend, I asked him for money. He didn't loan me any money when I asked him. Why didn't he loan me any money? Well, I already told you, he's a freaking tightwad. Right? So notice how easy these explanations are. Now, the more complicated explanations, and good for social psychologists, is those causes that are related to the actor situation. That is, I asked my buddy for money, he wouldn't loan it to me. I'm going to call him a tightwad or a cheapskate. But what actually happened is one of his relatives is suffering from a horrible disease and needed help paying a hospital bill. So my friend had no money to give me because he gave all his money to his relative to help with their hospital bill. That was a long-ass explanation, wasn't it? Isn't it easier to say he didn't give me any money because he's freaking tightwood, tightwad, rather than lay out this big situational story? So you can imagine then that we have a preference for dispositional explanations rather than situational explanations. Now, out of this, there's a couple related phenomenon. Uh, we call them errors or biases in social psychology, the fundamental attribution error, the actor-observer effect, and finally defensive attribution. So let's take each one in turn. I want to start with the fundamental attribution error, which is basically what I just described. Right? This is where we see an over-reliance on dispositional factors to explain an actor's behavior. So I'm driving down the highway, I'm in the number one lane, the fast lane on the freeway, and I'm doing 68 miles an hour because it's a 65 mile zone and I know I get three miles over the speed limit without any issue from the state troopers and I'm doing my 68 driving down the highway and all of a sudden immediately appears in my rear view mirror another car and I mean this car has come up on me so hard and so fast and they're so close I can't even see their grill they're like locked to my bumper almost and immediately I'm like what is wrong with this son of a bitch get off my ass stop tailgating you're gonna kill us all you idiot you fool where'd you get your driver's license a box of freaking crackers Jacks and I'm off and running. But then the better part of my human nature says, wait a minute. You have no idea why this person is on your ass and, and why are you hassling it anyway. Just move over to the other lane and let them go by, right? Why twist yourself up in knots about their behavior? And as I move my ass over and they then stop it and speed by, I see this guy driving, uh, but as they go by, I look in the back seat, and there's what might be his wife holding this bleeding baby. And I say, oh my God, son of a bitch. They're probably rushing to the hospital. Okay? It was a situation that dictated his driving behavior, but notice, my first, my go-to is to blame it on the person, not the situation. Right? So the fundamental attribution error, why do they call it the fundamental attribution error? Because we make it so readily, and we make it all the time. It is the most fundamental error in determining caus causality about another person's action that humans make. And it's that famous. Now, what are the possible causes? Well, it's easy to say, what an idiot, rather than 
investigate the situational causes. So it requires less mental effort, fewer cognitive resources. And it may become that it's hard for me to put myself in the other person's shoes. Right, and, and I don't know if any of you have done jury duty. Most of you are pretty young, so maybe you haven't had an opportunity to do jury duty. But imagine coming into the courtroom. You sit down in the jury box, and now you know the prosecution and the defense are going to come in. And you look at the defendant, and they sit in the defendant's chair. Have you ever sat in the defendant's chair? Probably not. So... It's easy to say they're sitting in the defendant's chair for a reason. They're in the defendant's chair because they did something wrong, right? And that would be the fundamental attribution error. We have no clue as to what's really going on. We're unable to put ourselves in that person's situation. And it may be simply just an unwillingness to consider situational explanations. A lot of times, people say, I don't want to listen to any frickin' excuses. You did it, and you suffer the consequences. Don't give me frickin' alibis or excuses or anything else. Bottom line, you did it. You deserve to be punished. Alibis, excuses, and you can see how this can kind of combine with racist attitudes, and that is we may be more than willing to acknowledge the excuses of one party and not another right gangbanger sits in that chair we're all like hey you got it coming to you here it comes buddy same crime committed by a police officer sitting in that chair and we're like well there's probably some reason that the officer did that that we look differently at the causes of behavior and if you doubt that example think about the capitol building think about when black lives matter was going to demonstrate the Capitol building. The Capitol building is lined with all kinds of police in military gear. What happens on January 7th, just a couple days ago? There's no police hardly to be seen because it's a different group of people who are going to march on the Capitol. <sighs> These things are insidious, right? And it's also social psychologists study this stuff up one side and down the other. Now, the actor observer effect. What do we see? When they do something bad, it's because of who they are. It's because of their disposition. When I do something bad, and it can even be the same thing, then I'm going to reference the situation. I'm going to try and explain it. It's not my responsibility. The situation required it. So we're really cognitively flexible. And notice how this protects the self. They're bad. They did it because they're bad. I did it because it was required. Right. Now, so that's the actor observer effect. And notice you can flip it around if you like. When they do something good, they were freaking lucky. Situational explanation. When I do something good, it's because I'm freaking awesome. Right. So possible causes. Well, different perspectives, right? That is looking at the world, looking at someone who's committed an act rather than looking inward at someone who's committed an act. Or it may be lack of information about the others. We really just don't know what's going on with them. Now, finally, this last one in a legal context, defensive attribution, uh, is, can be really devastating. Defensive attributions, that is, this can result in blaming the victim for their plight. So if we hear that a woman is raped, right, we hear this woman was raped, we're going to ask some questions. We're going to ask like, okay, so where was it? When was it? And then we get down to those insidious kind of pernicious questions. Well, what was she wearing? Was she alone? Was she drunk? And every one of those questions then is looking at pointing to the reason for her victimization and putting it on her making her responsible for her victimization. Now, we know this is a common practice, right? But the big question for social psychologists is, you know, once we determine shit happens, and that's, you know, kind of ancient social psychology, is we say this stuff happens. But more modern social psychology then forced us to say, hey, what is the mechanism that causes that to happen? Why do people engage in that? And what we found is the more similar an observer is to the victim, the more they're driven to engage in this defensive attribution process. And it's self-protective because the more similar I am to the victim, 
the more likely that the same fate could befall me. So to defend myself, to defend my sense of security, I have to find ways to distance myself from the victim. And that then mistakenly assures me that I'm safer, that they were responsible for their own outcome. And that wouldn't happen to me because I'm safe. Right? I do life differently than they do. So while they allowed themselves to be victimized, I'm smarter, wiser, better somehow, and I won't be victimized. Right? And if you've taken the course in the self here, or intend to, you're going to see the power of the self and maintaining the self and how this could operate. Now, what is this related to? A concept given to us by Lerner called uh, belief in a just world. And how many of you believe that the world is a, a fundamentally a just place where bad thing, when, when bad people do bad things, then they get punished, right? And when good people do good things, they get rewarded. And a lot of people believe that fully. Some of us a little less so, and some of us not at all, right? So belief in a just world is an actual scale that can assess the level of one's belief in a just world. It's not a yes or no, it's a continuum, and it varies in amount, right? Now, <laughs> this little picture here is uncomfortable. And we see a courtroom with the big label, the banner justice on it, and what do we see? Well, we see white people with a door labeled white walking up the staircase. We see the police going through a special door called police, and they get a freaking escalator. Meanwhile, people of color, black in this case, go in the side door. And is the justice system then different for different groups of people? To the extent that you believe this, right, is in part an example of your belief in a just world. Do you believe that when black and white people are tried for the same crime that they get the same deal? And note, police officers often commit crimes and don't get tried at all. They simply get time off. They get suspension. Uh, and quite often a suspension with pay. So, or they get terminated. But that's it, right? So different levels of justice for different groups of people. And, and if we look, I guess the, the most glaring example of this is going to be poor versus rich. Poor people are more likely to suffer the consequences of their actions than rich people. Rich people seem to be able to get a different justice system or, or somehow buy their way out of it. Okay, so questions about that? Okay, self-protection and justice then, belief in a just world, belief that the world is an orderly, predictable place where people get what they deserve. And many of us are looking now. You, you can see when we, have, uh, when we have the folks go and take over the Capitol building this week and, and think about it, right? What do we say? Well, there's some people who are calling them treasonous and insurrectionists. And in my opinion, I will place myself in that camp. They took over the Capitol building. They committed treason. They committed crimes against the federal government, right? And they should be punished as such. They should be tried and punished as such. Other people are simply calling them demonstrators. That's a wide difference of opinion. Wide difference in calling these people. Well, they were just disenfranchised. They were just upset about the election. So they needed an outlet for their anger. Others of us are saying, no, they're trying to take over the freaking government, right? So you can see broad difference in opinion. And this has been exacerbated over the four years. It's getting harder and harder for us to find common ground in our discussions. To me, belief in a just world says these people need to be tried. They need to be put on trial for treason against the United States government. And they need to suffer the consequences if they're found guilty of these crimes, right? Other people are saying, nah, you know, that's just, they were just, worked up and maybe got a little out of control. I don't know. So, belief in a just world. So, also a general belief that justice is the desired intended outcome of the legal process, and many of us might question that after observing these circumstances. Now, belief in a just world is kind of was developed by Lerner back in 1980. Belief in an unjust world is an interesting extension of this idea. Lin Chen Cheng, 2007. What are we talking about here? Well, some people believe that the world is an unjust place. 
And you ask the question, well, isn't that kind of just the flip side of believing it's a just place? And, and this is where experimental research can provide us some interesting insights. Belief in a just world and belief in an unjust world aren't two poles of a single continuum. They're actually two different constructs, right? And how do we know this? Well, they interview prisoners, right? And, and they interview guards. And prisoners were found to more strongly endorse belief in an unjust world. Whereas prisoners and guards equally endorse belief in a just world. Two different constructs on the basis of the results of this study. Let us then return to the idea of equality versus equity in tension. And, and let's ask these questions, and, and this kind of comes out of the second dilemma as an associated idea, right? Huh, buddy? Okay. Should a person be rewarded, punished in proportion to their contribution? <laughs> We're using team assignments, right? <laughs> and, and a lot of times, you know, students, a lot of students dislike team assignments because they, why do you dislike team assignments? Because you feel you, ha you do all the work, right? And someone else gets points for your work, right? You got the points as well, but they got points that they don't deserve. And I'm not arguing that. And what I've done, because I've listened to you guys carefully about this, and I've actually had assignments in past classes to try and figure out how to do this. And what I've come to at this point in time, and the idea will probably evolve, is on most assignments I have people clearly identify the portions of work that they did. Right. And also, uh, you know, if, if I think there's problems, I will I will get to the bottom of the problem one way or another. So, you know, but should a person be rewarded, punished in proportion to their contribution? So that's the question. Or should be people be compensated or punished equally? And, and these are equity versus equality. Equality, everyone gets the same, right, regardless of contribution. Equity is you get proportionally rewarded proportionally to your contribution. Uh, it's a tough one. And we talk about this in organizational psychology, as you can imagine, to a, to a greater extent. Which is more just? And I'll leave you to answer that. I, you know, uh, again, the opinions are going to differ on this. And it, but think about it. It does also get back to the second dilemma, and, and that is, you know, uh, Equality versus discretion. So that's about it. You got your second homework assignment there. Uh, I've enjoyed spending a little time with you, such as it is in, in this virtual fashion. Quincy's getting a little antsy because he knows that dinner time is on the horizon, and that's always breakfast and dinner time is a big event for us in this house. Uh, and I can just see movement around me saying, uh, what are you doing? Are you going to be done soon? And I am done, so you guys have a great day.